Happy Sunday to you. I am Tracy Leslie, Senior Pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Lafayette, Indiana. It is good to have you worship with us this week. Hear the scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, beginning at the start of the chapter. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. Do not bring us to the time of testing. Jesus also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. Suppose he were to answer from within, do not bother me. The door's already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his avoidance of shame, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door is open. Are there any among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if your child asked for an egg, would give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you. Oh, Christ. Decades ago, when I was in seminary and a student pastor, a little girl in the church preschool asked me what Jesus looked like. I paused and began to carefully explain. We don't really know because there weren't any cameras in Jesus's time. But another little girl interrupted our exchange, confidently announcing, well, I know what he looks like because there's a picture in my Bible. So what about you? How do you imagine Jesus? And in asking that question, I don't mean, does he look like a first century Palestinian Jew in your mind's eye, but rather, what is your image of God? Author Brennan Manning writes, it is always true to some extent that we make our images of God. It is even truer that our image of God makes us. Eventually, we become like the God we image. Eventually, we become like the God we image. Keep that idea in mind. This morning's scripture, while appearing to be a lesson in prayer, goes much deeper. It gets at our image of God. Because how we relate to anyone is dependent upon who we consider them to be. How we relate to anyone is about how we kind of judge their character to be, right? So this morning's scripture is about the character of God and how who we consider God to be shapes our communication and our relationship with God. This morning's parable, Jesus tells it in response to a question from his disciples, actually a request from his disciples. <clears throat> the beginning of chapter 11, Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. It's not an unreasonable or unusual request for disciples of a Jewish rabbi to make. He's their teacher, they're his students, and prayer is one of the three pillars of Judaism. This morning, I'd like to focus specifically on this parable, which is often misunderstood because 
it is often mistranslated. Well, one word specifically is mistranslated. And because we today are not adept in ancient Mediterranean cultural practices and values. Let me read the parable again. If you would like to, you're welcome to turn in your own Bible to where this parable is there in chapter 11 um, and to read along, even if it's not the same translation. Don't worry about it. Jesus said, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And that one answers from within, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you. Even though we will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his avoidance of shame, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Now, if you were reading along in your own Bible, you might have noticed there in verse 8, this is the mistranslation I'm talking about. You probably had a different word. Likely you had the word persistence. That's a bad English translation from the Greek, though, because the Greek word that's or the word that's used here in Greek, this is the only place it appears in our Bible. This is its only occurrence in scripture. But it is used, that specific word is used in other non-biblical text of this time period. And so that's important to take into consideration because just as English has evolved since the time of, well, you know, like Shakespeare, for example, right? Greek has evolved considerably. So the Greek of Bible times, not the same as contemporary Greek that people in Greece would speak, right? And so if we examine those ancient texts and, and take it from context, draw from context, we discover that a more accurate translation where many Bibles read persistence, a better translation would be shamelessness or a sense of shame. There is an English word for this, impudence. I don't think we use that word very often. Impudent is someone who is arrogant, disrespectful, and has no sense of shame. And that, that translation makes sense, right? Because if the message of this parable were about persistence, that you had to wear down God's defenses and cajole and persuade, well, that kind of message would be in conflict with the verses that proceed and follow, right? I mean, in the verse that immediately follows this parable, Jesus says, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find knock and the door will be open to you. That's the message of the parable. It might still be a little hard for us to relate to, though, without a better knowledge of ancient Mediterranean culture. After all, in our culture, it would be very reasonable to not answer your door if someone came knocking at midnight. We'd advise against it. In fact, in our culture, why not best text before they even phone to request a favor of someone? So allow me to illuminate some of these cultural distinctions that, um, that get in the way of our really fully appreciating this parable. First, hospitality is of extreme importance even today in Eastern and Middle Eastern cultures. A few years ago, I traveled to Jordan and went to see the ancient city of Petra. Now, when we think of the Middle East, I at least think of deserts. And when I think of deserts, I think heat. That morning when I woke up in Amman, it was snowing. I had not packed for that. As we walked through Petra, my guide noticed me shivering. He took off his shawl and he tied it around me. When we reached the bottom of the gorge, some locals were sitting by a charcoal fire, and with one subtle glance from our guide, they all cleared a spot for me to sit closest to the fire. Later, when we got back on the bus, I tried to give the scarf back to our guide, but I was not at all surprised that he refused to take it back. It was his gift to me. So that's our first cultural distinction. Hospitality is of extreme importance 
in the Middle East. But I wonder if you noticed something else in that story, that illustration I just gave. Did you notice that hospitality is not an individual or private thing? I'd never before seen those man, men at the bottom of the gorge huddled around the fire. Can't imagine I'll ever see them again. Even if I do, I won't recognize them. We didn't know one another. But because I was under the care of our Jordanian guide, they had no less responsibility for me than our guide did. So that's a second detail here. Hospitality is the job of everyone in the village. So hospitality is of extreme importance and it's the job of everyone. That leads to the next detail, that in Mediterranean culture, people don't think of themselves as individuals. They think of themselves as part of a group, their family, their clan, their village. As 21st century Westerners, we think in terms of the individual. We want our children to grow up and, and live their lives independently. We praise our children for their unique skills and gifts. We are a culture abundant with cliches that reveal this focus on individualism. Things like every man for himself. Look out for number one. Don't follow the herd. Blaze your own trail, right? I could go on and on. And all of that would sound like a bunch of crazy talk to Mediterranean folks because in their culture, people define themselves in relation to their group. So there's a third distinction. In Jesus's culture, people define themselves in relation to their group. So Hospitality is of extreme importance. Hospitality is everyone's job, and it is everyone's job because people don't think of themselves as individuals. They think of themselves in relationship to their group. That brings us to a final distinction. Nothing is as important as one's reputation, one's honor. And the opposite of honor is shame. In Mediterranean culture, shame is to be avoided at all cost. So again, some significant differences here. We try to teach our children not to worry about what their peers think of them. It doesn't matter what other people think. Be you, we tell them. Well, in Mediterranean culture, it matters a great deal what others think of me, especially those who are part of my group. So the final distinction is this, nothing is as important as one's reputation. One's reputation was like currency in the ancient Eastern world. Think about how many things you need in your own life. In America, credit is our thing, right? It's very little you could get by without having any credit. If your credit's bad, it's really tough, right? But reputation or honor or the currency in the ancient Eastern world. So now back to the parable. Now that we can better understand it, it makes a little bit more sense, right? That this traveler, even late at night, could knock on a neighbor's door or could knock on someone's door and expect to be taken in. It's about hospitality. And it makes perfect sense that the host goes and bangs on his neighbor's door to get bread for his guests because hospitality is the job of everyone in the village. And the very suggestion that this man would risk the reputation of himself and his village by not helping his neighbor would be unthinkable. It would be crazy because no one would ever want to risk their own reputation by bringing humiliation on their village. They are in this together. I mean, sure, he's fast asleep, but sure, he's finally managed to get the kids down for the night. And he doesn't want to get dressed, get up, turn on the lights, blah, blah, blah. But you better believe he's going to do it. Because even if he's not motivated by a fondness for his neighbor, the very least, he will not want everyone talking trash about him in the break room at work in the morning. He doesn't want to be that guy. He does not want to be dishonorable. I mean, this no, man knows what his culture expects of him, and he behaves according to those expectations in order to avoid being shamed. And my friends, 
If a tired, grumpy neighbor can still be counted on to get us what we need, how much more can we count on God to respond to our needs? How much more can our Heavenly Father be trusted to take good care of us? Even a grumpy neighbor does what she needs to in order to stay out of trouble. Even an earthly father, flawed though they may be, doesn't hand his kids a snake when they're hungry and they ask for fish sticks. Friends, we can count on God to be gracious and generous. The Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It is in God's nature to be merciful compassionate. And that's how Jesus behaves as he represents his heavenly father and acts on his father's behalf. Jesus's ministry teaches us and reveals to us the nature or character of God. Jesus heals the sick. He feeds the hungry. He blesses the people society kicks to the curb. And in all of that, he demonstrates the character, the nature of the heavenly father. God responds to our needs, not begrudgingly, like a neighbor awakened in the middle of the night. God's not that guy. God is never annoyed to hear from us. God responds to us eagerly and earnestly. You know, it makes all the difference in the world how we image God. It matters a great deal to us and to the people around us because how we image God and how we image ourselves in God's presence has an enormous impact, not only on our prayer life, but also on the way we live. If we believe God's love for us is dependable and reliable, we can live free from fear. We can live cooperatively with others instead of competitively. We can be generous with our resources instead of hoarding them. Friends, Jesus tells us straight up that we ought not to be afraid to ask, to seek, and to knock on heaven's door. Prayer is about building a relationship with God, and God wants to be in relationship with you. God always acts in our best interest. It is always true to some extent that we make our images of God. It is even truer that our image of God makes us. Eventually we become like the God we image. So may we image the God that Jesus reveals to us. Amen.